your strength would meet us in our weakness. And your power would meet us in our powerlessness. We present these petitions and praises in the name of Jesus, the great teacher. Amen. It's not locked in place. Yes. We continue in the prayer mode. We have many before us. They are listed in the blue insert in your bulletin. Our prayer requests. And some of these names will be on this prayer list for the indefinite foreseeable future. Audrey Godfrey, who is at home. Mark Brown, who is here. Dorothy Johnson, who is here. Michael Hampton, Shonda Blake, Alberta Settle, Isaac Wood, and Mother is here. I don't, I don't, I don't see uh, any other members of the family. Pray for Isaac, Charles Wiley, Derek Morris, Virginia Griffin, Calvin Eason, Steve Hinton, Doreen Wanless, Edward and Yubelin Patterson, Jasmine, John Gregory, wife is here. John Jan Kuski, whose wife is here. Dean Wanless, Michael Shopadia, whose wife is here. Ben Wilkinson Jr., David Scott, whose wife is here. We pray for these and for their families as they give them care, as they serve them, as they sit by their sides. We continue to pray for those who are doing their grief work. Nina Wanless has gone to London to be at the service of celebration of the life of her brother, Courtney Brown. We pray for her travel safety as she continues to do her brief work. And there are many prayer requests that are not listed here, but of which you are aware. We want to be people of prayer. We take seriously what it means to pray for someone. I hope that when someone says, pray for me, and we say, I will, I hope we'll actually do that. I hope we'll actually pray for them, name them, and take that promise very, very seriously. I want to give you just a few moments to pray in your own language, in your own way, in your own vehicle, and then it will be my joy to lead us in prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you for this opportunity to join together in prayer. And we thank you for the power of prayer. You have called us to be praying people. You've called us to the discipline of daily prayer. And we pray that we would not fail thee, nor fail our colleagues, as we have promised to be intercessors for and with them. We pray for these whose names we have called. We thank you that thou knowest their need long before it was ever made known to us. Some of them are very, very ill. Some of them are thinking they will not recover. Some of them are thinking they have long, long weeks and months ahead of them of recovery. Some of them are discouraged. Some of them are fearful. Some of them are anxious. Some of them have family members around them, but some of them are feeling quite forsaken. We pray, O oh God, that you, who have promised to be near to the brokenhearted, would be especially near to these. May they be cognizant of your presence, there in their bedrooms, in their hospital rooms, in their rehab centers. We would now name those in our hearts who are not on this list, but who are known to us and who stand in need of prayer. We thank you for this day and the beauty of it, for your creation, 
for this beautiful sun, for this beautiful blue sky, for this refreshing breeze that blows, for our ability to show up, we give you thanks and praise. We would add to this list the United States of America for her leaders. We would pray for the state of Georgia and our governor. We would pray for the city of Atlanta and our mayor and for the villages and municipalities around it and pray that in Lithonia and Stone Mountain and Redan you would be exalted that in College Park and in Dunwoody and in Smyrna you would be exalted we pray, O oh Lord our God, that we would respond to your call. Come and make peace with our Creator and forsake our sin and our submission to it and its dominion. And we would say yes to Jesus Christ, whom you sent for us and for our sin. Thank you, Lord Christ, for offering to forgive those who call upon you. Pray that you'd fill us with a repentant spirit and heart that we might be in right standing with thee and our Father God to whom you have introduced us and to whom you have brought us. We give thee thanks. And for the rest of this celebration of worship, May we focus on Thee. As we hear Your Word proclaimed, may we get it. May we understand what the Spirit says to the Church. We thank You for each other, for our brothers and sisters in the faith, for the family of God, for the community of faith, for the Church universal. We give You thanks. Now, O oh Lord, have Your way in us. We shall ever praise Thee and thank Thee evermore. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And everybody said Amen. Everybody sang Amen. Everybody sang Amen. 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 God has heard us. Amen. As we pray to Him, Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Now let us affirm what we believe in the reciting of the Apostles' Creed. And the same attitude of reverent prayer. Let's recite the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. For then shall come the judge, the quick, and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Everybody said, Amen. Most of you gave an offering as you came on to the property. If you did not have opportunity to do that, I'll ask you to simply do that at the end of the service. Uh, unless you, you want to do that now, you want to walk about. Uh, so there's a basket at the bottom of the steps. Thank you. And because of your offering, you can still have it in your hand, and you're just going to sing a short song of praise. 
We want to affirm and give thanks to God for this privilege. I'm going to read together the prayer that we pray every Sunday when we are indoors uh, as we give our gifts. And then uh, John will come and give thanks for the offering. And then we'll sing this. Uh, we're going to sing uh, the thank the Lord for the musician. that is God the giver, we thank you for these resources you have entrusted to us. As we give, we do so with grateful hearts. With cheerfulness, we return a portion of your gifts. And Crossroads Church may care for the financially distressed, spread the gospel to the nation, address economic and political injustices, create and sustain ministries to develop disciples of Jesus the Christ. As we give, we pray that you, holy God, will teach us how to give. May our motives be pure, our hearts be glad, and our hands be open. We pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. shall be thanks be to God. Hear the word of the Lord, Luke 8, 43 and following. Now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years, who had spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any, came from behind and touched the border of his Christ garment. And immediately, her flow of blood stopped. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitude throng and press you. And you say, Who touched me? But Jesus said, Somebody touched me. For I perceive power going out of me. Now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared to him 
in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. Jesus said to her, Daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated if you are. Holy God, we thank you for your authoritative, practical word. And pray that as we preach it and hear it and receive it, we might be like those of Berea, who heard your word and who were more noble than those in Thessaloniki, and who received your word with eagerness and searched the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. May we be like them. Amen. I call this the draining touch. The draining touch. This text begins with a rather depressing description of a woman. Did you see it? She has been hemorrhaging off and on for 12 years. That's a long time. She is financially drained and exhausted. The text says she has spent, listen to this, not lots of money. Uh, look at the text. Uh, the text says of her, she spent, this is in verse 43, all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any of them. Translated, paraphrased, she drained her life savings, pulled all her money out of her 401k, drained her Fidelity stock portfolio, and gave all the money to doctors looking for some answers, looking for some cutting edge treatment, and not one of them could help her. That's depressing. Mark, in fact, tells us something that Luke, a physician, might conveniently leave out. Mark says in, in the parallel passage of Mark 5, Luke is a physician, so in his gospel, he's not going to put in this part. Mark says that the woman, the woman spent all she had and was no better. In fact, she got worse. Now, the physician's not going to put that part in there. But Mark says she spent all her money on the doctors and to make it worse, she didn't even get better. She got worse than before she gave them her money. That's in Mark 5, 25 and 26. You read it right in the book. This is a depressing narrative, at least at the beginning of it. I hear Psalm 108, verse 12. Give us help from trouble, for the help of man is useless. Have you ever felt that way? This woman did. The help of these human doctors is completely unavailable. I wonder if this woman felt like she was never going to get better. She has been labeled incurable. I want to consider her condition. First look at her social condition. Because of her condition, and you read this, I won't take the time to read it now, but in the book of Leviticus, there are very specific rules and protocols regarding what happens to you if you are a person who has a discharge coming from your body. If you are hemorrhaging or having some other fluid coming from your body other than blood, if you are having any kind of discharge, there is a custom, a protocol, a social instruction given in the book of Leviticus. And that is that you are, for all intents and purposes, a social outcast. Your defilement affects all your relationships. If she was to sit on an item, that item was now unclean. If she was intimate with her husband, he was then unclean for seven days. 
if she had any hemorrhaging other than her customary monthly cycle, she was considered unclean. Pastor Stephen Cole has written, this woman's ceremonial defilement is a graphic picture of how sin defiles us all. It creates distance between us and God, as well as distance from our family and friends. End of quote. Well, Cole is right that just as this woman's illness prevented her from interacting intimately with people because of her discharge of blood, likewise, when we are not in right standing with our God, there are certain relationships that just can't happen. Before we touch Jesus and Jesus touches us, we are all just like this woman. We spend our resources trying to get better. And ultimately, there is no wholeness apart from the Christ. But notice her social condition. Because of her physical condition, she cannot enjoy the intimacy and the relationships which she would normally enjoy. Notice her spiritual condition. Matters are not going well between this woman and her doctors between this woman and her colleagues, her family, her friends, perhaps even between her and herself. It is time to try Jesus. This woman took a risk and touched the fringe, the hem, the edge of Jesus' garment. And Jesus asks a question as she begins to explore the spiritual options that are before her, Jesus asks what seems to be to us and to Peter and his colleagues a ridiculous question. There is a throng of people around Jesus, human flesh pressing everywhere, and Jesus says, who touched me? Well, the, the snarky, smart Alec answer is everybody. What do you mean, who touched you? Look at all these people. Everybody's touching you. And Jesus said, no, no, no. This was, this was a different touch. Luke's version of the story says, something went out of him. Something went out from him. It was no ordinary touch. It was a draining touch. The woman is trying to figure out if there's any other option besides bleeding into isolation and loneliness. Is there any option besides bleeding her way to financial ruin? So she decides to touch Jesus. How does one drain the eternal? This woman by her faith, actually took something out of Jesus. Isn't that a fascinating concept? She touched him in such a way, I, I don't know what it was about her touch, but something went out of her faith, but something went out of Jesus. Power. This hemorrhaging woman approaches Jesus in desperation and faith. And because of that rare mixture of desperation and faith, something happens to that woman. In fact, she experiences something that many of us will never experience. Mark says that many beg to touch the hem of Jesus' garment. In fact, Mark says that as many as touched him were made well. Mark chapter 6. I want to bear public witness. I want to testify. I want to bear public witness to the change that takes place when any desperate person dares to get serious about Jesus and touches him, figuratively or literally. What, what happens when we get serious about Jesus and stop calling him something as ridiculous as the man upstairs or somebody's out there, somebody's looking out for me, you know, 
you know, that one. We can't even say his name. I'm not talking about that. that that's, that's shallow. What, what happens when a person admits his or her desperation and cries out to, reaches out to the Christ? who is our only option at some point. She's gotten to that point. She tried doctors. Maybe they can make me well. Well, that didn't work. She tried draining her financial resources. That didn't work. She couldn't go to her colleagues because she is isolated socially by custom and protocol. So that didn't work. Right now, her desperation leads her to Jesus. And this woman doesn't just feel better as a result of her taking her desperate self to the master. She is better. She doesn't just feel better. Some people say, well, you know, I want to go to church because when I go to church, I just, I don't know, I just, I just feel better. Well, good for you. But we're not here to help you feel better. We're here to help you be better. To present Christ to you as the option for intimacy. And when one comes to know him, when one touches him, when one reaches out to him in desperation, one is actually made better. Not just feel better, you're better. Really better. Did you see it in the text? She reached out to him and she was healed immediately. Wow. She reached out to him and she was healed immediately. Immediately her flow of blood stopped. The hemorrhaging stopped. <laughs> when was the last time you took your desperate self to Jesus and reached out to him and asked for his touch on your circumstances, on your body? When was the last time you sang or said or prayed I need thee, oh I need thee, every hour I need thee, oh bless me now my Savior. I come to you, like the woman, I, I come. That is this woman's theme hymn, I need thee, oh I need thee. It's what every human being on the planet needs to be saying and singing. She has no other viable option, her money is gone, verse 43. Her relationships are strained due to the disease and, and the customs and protocols that must be followed because of it. And in light of this, she desperately reaches for Jesus. Now some people in the crowd touch Jesus, I'm sure, by accident. They, they were just there, and he was there, and their bodies just fell into each other. But this woman touched him on purpose. This woman didn't just happen to be there and, and got a touch. She sought him out. She went for him. This past week, many of us were in Greece. 32 of us were in Greece. And in some of the, um, on some of the islands that are tourist spots, there were throngs of people in the narrow streets of Santorini and Rhodes. Isle of Patmos, throngs of people, and you could not help but touch a person. You you weren't trying to, but in order to get where we wanted to go, we had to, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, and occasionally your elbow hit another, you weren't trying to hit somebody, just couldn't help it. Well, that's the scene here in Luke chapter 8. But this woman wasn't just simply in the crowd and got bumped by Jesus. She sought Jesus out, and my prayer for you, for us all, is that we will not just simply take Jesus as someone who's out there, up there, but that we'll seek him out and want to spend time with him and experience him. And this woman's desperation and her determination led to her deliverance. The woman feared she might be rebuked. You saw it in the text. Verse 47, she was thinking, uh oh, I'm in trouble now. But she pressed on for her healing. Notice what makes her well. It is not her positive thinking. It is not her 
sowing a generous financial seed into the ministry of Jesus. Notice it's not her being a good person. No, it was her faith. I'm experiencing some jet lag. I was up early this morning and early in the, the wee hours I was watching television, I was channel surfing and about three o'clock this morning a tele-evangelist who shall remain nameless was on the air selling vials of miracle water. You called into that 1-800 number or went to his website or called a 1-800 number you could get this little bottle of miracle water and he said that we should sprinkle it on our body. I won't tell you what I said out loud to the television and what I wanted to say to him. No, this woman is not healed by some trickery. She's not healed by sending in a generous offering to some charlatan she is healed by her faith, by expressing faith in the Jesus in whom all power resides. In both the Old and New Testament, the word for well is variously translated save, deliver, preserve, protect, make whole, do well. Listen to this text. Woman, be of good cheer. In fact, Jesus calls her daughter. Uh, the intimacy has already started. Not, hey you, but daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Your faith has saved you. Your faith has delivered you. Your faith has preserved you. Your faith has protected you. Your faith has made you whole. Your faith has given you the ability to do well. Did you hear it? This woman doesn't just feel better, she is better. She is now delivered. I want to suggest that a higher level of our faith is that level on which we take the risk and touch Jesus. Now let's figure out how to do that. How to have a relationship with Him that could very well be said they could very well be described as intimate. Do you have that? Are you embracing Jesus and touching Him? Are you touching the fringe of His garment? Are you touching the border of His robe? Are you praying at such a level that it could be said you have touched the very Son of God? This is a narrative in which the woman is anything but abstract and theoretical. So she's, she's hands-on. <laughs> you know, it would be more comfortable for some if ministry could be done without our personal space being invaded. I wouldn't mind ministering to people, but I don't want them touching me and everything. Ugh. But it's impossible to do the kind of ministry to which Jesus calls us without touching without getting involved, without getting close to people. It's impossible, just impossible. Somebody told me they went to a church, a mega church, with a very well-known, nationally known preacher. And the person went up at the end of the service and wanted to meet the preacher. The person had heard the preacher on radio and TV for many years, and they were excited to be there and wanted to go greet the preacher and they reached out their hand and one of the preacher's handlers, one of the preacher's armor bearers, one of the preacher's bodyguards said, oh no, can't touch him. That's not Jesus. Jesus doesn't have handlers around him who prevent the woman from touching him. In fact, Peter tries to frame it so that the woman doesn't look bad and Jesus is not getting paranoid. Peter says, Come on, there are lots of people. No, 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 says Jesus. This was a different touch. Somebody touched me who desperately needed to touch me. Somebody touched me 
and something went out of me. Somebody touched me and got something. <laughs> and that's really where I want to be. I, I want to be in that state of mind in my pursuit of the Christ where my desperation and my determination lead me to explore what it is like to be intimate with Him, to touch Him and to be touched by Him. I got to end. I was reading this week about the Bucharest Early Intervention Project. It's a project in which a randomized group of foster children, 136 of them I think, uh, were uh, studied and they were studied from the time they entered this trial until they were uh, probably 21 years old or so and it was to stu the study was to see the effect of intimate interaction with the children versus leaving them alone to simply eat and drink their bottles and eat their food and not have engagement with a caring adult frightening results. Harry Harlow did an experiment on attachment theory using some rhesus monkeys. They had some of them clutch a wire mother, a fake monkey mother with a face but just a wire cage for a body. And then some others, he covered the wire body with terry cloth. Almost every rhesus monkey went to the terry cloth covered wired monkey mother because they enjoyed the comfort of that cloth. Children who were raised in an environment of neglect or cold, non-physical detachment can suffer cognitive, developmental, and even motor skill delays. This woman was not left to simply try to figure it out. She got a touch. Something went out of Jesus and into her. She was not neglected. She was not told to just get next to this wire Jesus and work it out. Now here's a statue, work that out. No, I, I need to touch the living Lord, she thought. And that made all the difference. May we who are determined to be a Matthew 25 people find ways to not simply think about the prisoner, but go touch the prisoner. Not only think about the student at Redan High School, but actually find some way to touch them, to physically touch them, to show up, to be present, to make a difference by the way we use our skills, our resources. May those of us who are determined to be Matthew 25 people find some way to touch other people and to touch Jesus. And may we, for the glory of God, experience His touch. May something go out of us, faith, and may something come into us, the virtue of the risen one. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you for this woman who was drained of her resources, but who was invested in by you. We thank you, O oh Lord our God, for allowing us to have experiences like this woman. We thank you for those days we cried out to thee, and you heard us, and you saved us. You delivered us from our sin and from ourselves. We praise you. I pray now for those who might be here who are as desperate as this woman and who need Jesus as much as she needed him. May they cry out to you as did this woman. May they in faith reach out you, O Lord God. We thank you that you make us better, that you make 
the incomplete person whole. That you fix the broken, wounded person. That you save sinners. That you stop the hemorrhaging that's taking place in so many of us. Oh Lord our God, we praise you. Thank you for the draining touch that has been ours to know. Thank you for that which comes out of our Savior, for that which comes into us. May we love Jesus with all our hearts till he shall come again whereupon we may love him even more and love him in a greater way. We give you thanks now for this opportunity to remember him and his sacrifice at Calvary. We respond to his command to remember him and to as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, remember Him. We remember Jesus now. We praise you for His life, for His sacrifice, for His death, for His resurrection, for His ascension, and for His present intercession at your right hand, O God our Father. We praise you for him, for his life, for his touch, for his sacrifice. In his name we pray with thanks to him. Amen. Sharon Gregory, to please come and assist me at the table. Would you please take your communion kit which you've received? upon entry onto the property. If you did not receive a communion cup and bread, would you please uh, just wave your hand outside your car and we'll see to it that you serve the back row there, brown car, Walter, thank you. Anybody else need to be served? Is that a hand there? Yes, on this front row, way at the end of this front row, Walter or Mary, way at the end of this front row, then the back row there. I'm going to ask the Reverend Gregory to pray. Yes, on the front row here, Mary. They got it. Okay. All right. No. I'm going to ask the Reverend Gregory to give thanks for both the bread and the cup as we prepare to remember Jesus our Savior. Blessed Savior, thank you, O bread of heaven, for giving us what we could not in any way do for ourselves, for providing your body, our bread, and your blood, our wine, that we would remember you and live through your blood, you descend here and be forgiven of our sins, and from the bread of life that we would receive newness and renewal as you mercifully and generously give it to us. Bless these elements and our hearts so that we honor you in all that we say and do. In Jesus' name. Beloved, you have in your hand that which represents the body of Christ, that body which was broken for you, bruised, ripped, torn on behalf of sinful women and men, boys and girls. Beloved, the body of Christ, eat it and rejoice.
Matthew chapter 26 says that Jesus on that night that meal gave them the cup and when he gave the cup to them he said something that they had never heard at any Passover ceremony, any Passover meal Jesus put a new spin on it all together. He said this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This represents a new arrangement a new agreement between you and God. This cup is now not ordinary wine. This cup is my blood poured out for you. As you drink it today, be mindful of the extraordinary sacrifice of our Lord Christ in our behalf. The blood of Christ. Drink ye all of it. Holy God, we thank you for the opportunity to remember again what Jesus did in our behalf. We have heard the story countless times. We have seen it reenacted in film, on video. We can still never get over it. Thank you, Lord Christ, for your giving yourself in our places to satisfy the judgment of God. We praise you, Lord Jesus, for your body and your blood, for your sacrifice and your life, for your teaching and your commandments for your example and your presence. We praise thee, O Lord, our God. Amen. Close our time today. Close our time today. Let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. This is a hymn which addresses various aspects of one's life, one's body. Take my hands, take my lips, Take my will. I pray that as we leave this place today, our entire being might be offered to our God. Amen.
look up and receive the benediction. Now, people of God, go from this place and may you be drained in wonderful ways. May you give of yourselves in ministry. May you give of your energies, your resources, that God might be honored and pleased. And may you experience the draining on a certain level of our Lord Himself. May something come out of Him and into you. May you find yourself growing in intimacy with this Lord who loves you to death and loves you to life. Go from this place and may you touch Jesus and may you experience Jesus touching you. All for His glory and not our own. Amen and good day. Would you honk those horns and say...